and stuff helping out. Uh, so uh, thanks for joining me, Mike. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. It's exciting. All right, so uh, you've been with Docker, what, a year or so? Yeah, about uh, 18 months, a little over. Okay, uh, and uh, tell us a little bit about your background. I know you worked at Puppet. Um, you know, what brought you to Docker and what's your kind of day-to-day -day job there? Yeah, so actually going way back, yeah. I was actually an IT architect and, and, and network. I was a certified Banyan engineer. Yeah. I was an MCSC 3.1, yeah. MT 3.1. And, and, and I did, you know, we date ourselves. I remember Banyan. I'm a yeah. networking guy. I mean, here in New England, we have lots of those technology. I mean, you know, Bay and all, all, all those companies that, you know, the 128 corridor, like, used to be known for networking. Now the younger generation's been like, no, no, it's all out in the valley. Yeah, I actually <laughs> took my uh, some of Banyan training over here in Worcester, yeah. just like up the road. So I did that for a long time, and then um, at some point um, was recruited into Microsoft and started as a systems engineer, moved into product marketing, product management, so I shipped a bunch of versions of Windows, got caught in an earthquake with Bill Gates on stage. Uh, from there, I went, uh, ended up at VMware, did about six years at VMware, which is where I learned about virtualization. Uh, after that, I moved to Puppet Labs, spent about 18 months there, which sort of got me into open source, and then sort of bringing those two technologies together or sort of solving those same sort of problems in a different way. Uh, there was an opportunity to go to work with Docker with some of the people I'd worked with previously at VMware who I really respect. Yeah, it was interesting. I remember it wasn't the like founders and the early people, but when Docker really started growing, there's a bunch of VMware talent down there because uh, while they, they aren't completely opposed and have to, you know, not work with others. Some of the growth and some of the ecosystem that you need to build, it, at least to me, it rhymes as to what I remember from 15 years ago when virtualization was coming out. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I see parallels there, yeah. right? I mean, we need a management plane. Yeah. We need to figure out how to, how the, we kind of got the networking worked out. We got to work on the storage components. We just did the infinite acquisition to help us along that way. But yeah, I definitely see parallels from where I was when I joined VMware in 2008 to where I am at Docker today. Okay, great. And maybe, you know, we, I've had it many times. We've had, you know, Ben Golubon, you know, the Cube every year at DockerCon, and uh, it, most of our audience hopefully knows the, you know, VM, Docker, and how they fit together, but maybe just give us the thumbnail as to, you know, why it's, you know, cats and dogs living together is okay uh, with VMs and Docker. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think it's actually like different types of dogs or different types yeah. of cats, right? Yeah. The, the end of the day, the beauty of Docker is the infrastructure that you run your application on is your choice. And a, a, most of our customers today are actually choosing virtualization, right? VMware or Hyper-V or whatever it is. And the reality is that's a, that's a good choice. Um, you may not have the, the quantity of workload it takes to natively drive the utilization you need to make your hardware affordable if you're just running containers, right? We're in the early days, the early stages. So being able to put some containers next to some traditional VMs to maximize resource capabilities is a big use case. Uh, the other one is uh, around some of the functionality and existing tool sets, right? So if you're a VMware shop and you've invested into vSphere administrators and, they, and they've got their tooling in place, you might want to leave that intact while you come up to speed on containers. And the beauty of the container is, if it makes sense to be in a VM, that workload can stay in the VM. If it makes sense to move it to the cloud, we can easily move it to the cloud, or even to bare metal. And there's reasons for all three of those scenarios, but Docker just makes it much simpler to kind of pick and choose where it's going to end up. Yeah, Mike, I, one of the lines I love from, from your session, it was, you know, you have to make a lot of decisions along the way, and what containers can help do is insulate you from, oops, I made an architectural, you know, I, I need to make a shift, maybe I didn't make the best architectural decision, and, and, I, and I can make some, some different changes there. Yeah, you know, I, what I generally do is I ask the audience, how many of you have ever done a <laughs> complex architecture and yeah. got it right the first time? <laughs> There's usually like one guy, and nobody likes that guy, yeah. but he's in the audience, yeah. but the rest of us, are mortal, and, and when you make a decision, you say, well, we put it in the cloud, but it really should have been in the data center. The economics of that application are not suited for cloud, or, or it's in the data center, but I really want to be able to do some bursting and scaling, let's move it back to the, uh, to the cloud. Those sort of things become less uh, convoluted with Docker containers than they do traditionally. Yeah, so the, the whole cloud discussion has gotten really complicated over the last few years. Uh, even, you know, I've, I've been at AWS reInvent the last few years, and what was really simple four years ago, it's like, wow, they announced a thousand new features this year, um, and there's so many pieces, everything from, yeah, containers, how they fit, to, you know, the AWS Lambda serverless stuff there. Um, you know, I try to say, well, let's start with your applications and your data, and what are you trying to do there? So. Talk to us about, you know, how does Docker look at applications? You know, what kind of applications are fitting into, you know, kind of the Docker environment? You know, what's kind of the same as what we had before and what, what's different? Yeah, so when I joined in, in summer 2015, 18 months ago, you didn't talk about Docker unless you were talking about microservices and DevOps, right? And there was a lot of 
buzzword soup. And what we're seeing as we talk to customers who are deploying in production, we're seeing people doing a lot of lifting and shifting, right? They're saying, I want to I want to improve my resource utilization or I want to have some portability. So let me put this thing in a container. And then maybe I will take it and I will start breaking it apart. And maybe I'll call out the authorization module and I'll have an authorization container and the rest of the application. And then maybe I'll pull out the catalog lookup or I'll pull out the uh, you know, user uh, catalog or whatever it is. Um, and so we, we really are seeing people focus sort of on like taking that monolithic application, moving it into a container. Typically, um, they're starting with the front end applications and then they're moving to the databases second because databases, while we have hundreds of customers doing them every day, um, I actually don't know how many we have. Maybe we have hundreds, maybe we have thousands, maybe we have two, I don't know. But we have customers <laughs> doing it. Um, but you know, they do, people do use databases with Docker, and that's a common misconception that you can't. But it requires a little bit more planning. So people say, let's go for the low-hanging fruit and then move into those more de uh, you know, sort of demanding scenarios second, in the second phase. Okay, and th the other big change over the last year or so is it used to always be Linux, and now you've got Windows containers in there. How does that impact what applications are going on uh, to a Docker environment? Well, I think the beauty of that is I don't want a solution for 40 to 60% of my data center, right? And, and when you talk to people, I talked to somebody today, I said, what do you run? They go, oh, we run Red Hat. I'm like, well, how much Red Hat? And they're like, well, 60%. I'm like, well, okay, so you don't want to leave 30 or 40% of your data center out in the cold. So by bringing uh, Docker containers, and, and that's the really cool thing, is it is Docker, it's the Docker engine okay. running on Windows. It's, just, it's over two years of joint effort and engineering between uh, Microsoft and Docker to make that happen. And so now we're seeing people looking at IIS web apps. We've seen SQL Server be uh, put into a container. Uh, you know, coupling it with Nano Server, it gets really exciting to build lightweight containers for next generation applications. So it's uh, the, the whole embracing of open source by Microsoft, their work, top five contrib contributor to the Docker open source project, I think it just, it, it's nothing but goodness for IT uh, operators everywhere. Yeah, and, and you know, this started out as a, you know, VMUG, and when you talk about VMware applications, I mean, the number one application, it's Windows stuff. I mean, it was right. always Windows was in there. Absolutely. That, that must give a nice roadmap to be able to either, you know, extend or change into the container ecosystem. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, I, I had a friend that I worked with, uh, Charles Wyndham at VMware, and Charles got uh, internet famous, or whatever you want to call it, because he figured out how to really productionalize Exchange onto VMware wrote a book about it, spoke about it on all the, the uh, VMworlds. I think that you know, you're going to start seeing that sort of work being done in the container world. People are going to look at some line of business applications, maybe some package software, and say, okay, how do I get this optimized? Uh, I had a lot of people come up to me and say, how can I get SharePoint running in a container? I think that would be great. I, don't, I, don't know, I know that it's been done, but you know, getting it to work in the lab and getting it to work in production, different things. But I think that's the journey we're on, right? And that same journey we went on with, with virtualization. So, Mike, you know, I've been watching Docker for a number of years now, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster. I mean, I remember like two years ago, it was, you know, everybody's like, Docker, Docker, Docker. Um, and last year, with Docker Data Center and some of the, 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 the you know, movement that Docker's made, you know, some of the ecosystem revolted a little bit. It feels like some of the air has come out of uh, some of the hype. Are we in, you know, what I want to understand from you is, you know, what do you hear from customers? Is this just, you know, the talking heads and the people that watch the industry? Are we in the, you know, what's that, the trough of disillusionment uh, right now? You know, what do you hear from users? How much do they look at that ecosystem uh, and, and feedback out there versus, you know, what they're just using your stuff for? I think, I think there's a, there's, the truth is somewhere in between, and I'm not sure how far to one extreme or the other. The reality is that um, I don't go to an event where people aren't just like effusive about Docker. They love Docker. And, and I love that. Like I, I remember getting that feeling at VMware as well. People love VMware, ESX in the early days. It solved real problems for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there has been some discontent on the fringes. And I think people who are more deeply into the ecosystem may feel that a little more profoundly. But like today, I'm in a room with maybe 50, 100 people, I don't know how many were in there, there was three people that had used Docker, yeah. right? And so, when you live in that space, everything is amplified. The reality is that the orchestration war isn't over. Yeah. The, the moves that Docker has made to make the platform better for our customers are, um, I think, the right moves, and I think that the ecosystem is going to find the balance it needs over the next couple of years. Um, you know, and I think that I think that there's plenty of space for everybody. And and at Docker, we've always believed batteries included but replaceable. 
And so I think that will continue to be our mantra. Yeah, can you help parse some, great feedback, thank you on that. Just some of the, like the orchestration discussions there. I mean, Microsoft's a partner, you know, there, there's all the stuff that they're, they're doing in Azure. Uh, Kubernetes, uh, you know, obviously has a lot of activity going on there. Uh, and, you know, we were at KubeCon and, you know, it seems to be, you know, a, a lot of growth there. Uh, you've got Mesos out there, there there's other options versus uh, kind of Docker Swarm. Uh, how, do, how does that play out for you guys today? So nobody wants to deploy, and if you, actually if you, I was watching a Kubernetes chalk talk, and the first thing the guy said was, nobody just wants to deploy a container, you've got to do something with it. So if everybody wants to do something with a container, then does not belong in the engine, does not belong in the runtime, and that's sort of the kind of, the, I think the way we kind of looked at it was, was like, you have to orchestrate these things. And we've had Swarm coming from FIG for years, right? Um, we just did a better version of it and we integrated it more tightly with the engine because really when you do that, there's a whole bunch of other things you can do behind it. Like uh, we're releasing Docker 1.13, I actually released yesterday, um, and it includes secrets management, which is for swarm mode because it uses the swarm distributed store. So by having that architecture, there's a whole bunch of things we can do. Yes, there's Kubernetes and that's a great solution, right? And, and for some customers, they may look at that and say, that works for them. And other customers, you know, there's Mesos. If you, if you have to orchestrate multiple types of workloads, maybe Mesos is a good choice for you, Mesos and Marathon. Um, I think that you know. I think that we're very proud of the work that the community and the, and and our developers have done around Swarm Mode. I think that customers are excited by it. Um, you know, you you get this sort of fully highly available, secure by default with TLS encryption, with the service discovery and the load balancing and everything, and you get it started with four four words like, you know, Docker Swarm create or Docker Swarm init, right? And and you've got a swarm running. It's hard to argue against that. Yeah. Um, Curious, how does serverless impact what are you guys doing? Is, you know, they, when we talked about kind of the adoption and people understanding containers, I mean, serverless were a little bit earlier in there, but, you know, definitely at reInvent this last year, oh my God, I mean, we all got Echo Dots, and, we're, you know, I know lots of people that are home creating skills. A um, little bit different use case, but microservices and stuff comes up, so, you know, how do those fit together? Yeah, I, you know, I honestly don't know, okay. right? I think, that, I think that that is a path that's yet to be sorted out. We did have a, a hack. It wasn't a product announcement or anything, but we had a hack of, of serverless Docker um, at DockerCon, I think in Europe. It might have been here in the, yeah, it was in Europe. Um, you know, so, so people are out there kind of monkeying around and, and finding out where those bridges are. I think the, when you start looking at like, how do you bridge to legacy, I think Docker is probably a better position to bridge to legacy than say serverless, but um, next gen, I'm not sure, you know? I mean, I think service is compelling, it'd be interesting to see where it goes. Well, As a technologist, I think it's cool. Yeah, absolutely, and it's definitely one of those emerging areas. All right, last question I have for you, Mike. You talk about, you know, all these emerging, all these things changing, you know, the pace of change is just, you know, it's, we're at breakneck speed these days. You know, a, a, a friend of mine and I was sat down and we said, you know, we used to all work on 18 month release cycles and then, you know, things like OpenStack came out and we're like, okay, yearly release cycles. It's like, you know, Docker I think is at like six week release cycles and when I talk to people inside of Docker, it's like, boy, is it tough to keep up for that. And if the people inside creating it are having a hard time, you know, the ripple effect to, you know, those practitioners, those users, I mean, you know, like you did earlier in your career, how, how, do, you, how do you help people as you're out talking users, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that pace of change uh, if, if you're you know, running IT? Yeah, first I, I acknowledge and ex <laughs> accept and validate everything you just said. Yeah. I had someone come up to me and say, how do you keep track of it all? And I'm like, like, I just do my best. I mean, and I'm there and I have briefings and, and um, but I think you know, one thing we're trying to be is very open and sharing. So we, we hold um, Docker online meetups almost weekly. Like I think every other week there's an online meetup where you can get, hear from the engineers that are working on this stuff. Um, a lot of blog postings, a lot of stuff in the community. But I think if you're out there and you're a vSphere admin today or you're a uh, you know, SCVVM or VMM out there, whatever it is you're using, and you're interested in Docker, rather than chase the technology, chase the use case. Figure out what matters to you and how do I implement that using Docker? And that's going to allow you to sort of the wheat from the chaff, signal to noise, right? You're going to focus on things you care about. Maybe you don't care about orchestration today because it's not quite there yet. Maybe, maybe the networking, you just need the sort of fundamental benefits. I think if you, if you focus on the, the use case, the problem you're trying to solve, you'll learn at the pace that's right for you. And we'll do everything that we can through meetups, uh, online, in person, blog postings, 
Um, you know, our GitHub account is a great way to stay abreast of everything we're doing. Um, for the people who want to be super aggressive and, and super involved, uh, we'll put that stuff out there for them. All right, well, Mike, great advice for, for the users. Really appreciate you taking the time to come talk to our audience, and we'll be back with lots more coverage here, and be sure to check out siliconangle.tv. We will be at DockerCon Austin in April, so be sure to check that out, and thanks for watching theCUBE. Since the dawn of the cloud, the cube has been